Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Deepti Naik. I'm an assistant professor at UC Berkeley. Um, and today, at the topic of this conversation slash discussion is, let's talk about methane and where is all of the methane coming from? Um, so as many of you know, uh, especially those of you who just attended my talk, uh, methane is a potent greenhouse gas. Um, so if you see here, um, on a 20-year timeline, a single molecule of methane absorbs as 80 to 85 times as much heat as a single molecule of CO2. Um, besides just being you know, a gas that absorbs more heat, there's a substantial social cost to methane as well. And then those people who do these kinds of estimates suggest that there's about $2,000 of social cost per ton of methane compared to just $62 for CO2. Um, and so one thing that is particularly disturbing about methane right now um, are the trends that we've been seeing of late. Um, so in the early 2000s, which is when a lot of climate policy was being devised, um, methane was essentially at equilibrium in the atmosphere. So the sources and sinks were kind of in sync with each other. And what that meant was that there was no more methane being added. But something changed around the mid 2000s. Um, and what we started seeing was that there was a steady growth in the methane levels on our planet. And that steady growth was happening linearly but now, in the last five years or so, that steady growth has actually become accelerated growth. So we're seeing that the rates are rapidly increasing. And so now we're reaching a point where we might actually encounter a methane-mediated climate crisis, maybe even sooner than a CO2-mediated climate crisis. And so to summarize kind of the plot that you've seen here, uh, there's a lot of climate scientists who are taking methane very, very seriously and thinking about how to mitigate methane. Um, and I really enjoy this quote because it tells you about the urgency in thinking about methane mitigation measures and how fast we need to put them in practice. Right, so when you so see something like this, I think a question that would pop in your head is where is all of this methane coming from? And that's the title of my talk. Um, and so how do you do this? Like, how do you, at a global scale, start to pinpoint the sources of a greenhouse gas like methane? And so this is something that people in the geochemistry field have been thinking about for a while. And what they do is they use something called the isotope signature. But before I talk about that, I want to show you what the major sources of methane on our planet are. So about 30% of the emissions of methane come from either chemical or geological sources. So this could be a coal plant, this could be an uh, oil rig, right? So most of the methane in these places is produced by thermogenic and abiotic processes. Um, the second major source of methane on our planet are biological sources. So think about all the methane that's coming from a wetland, uh, methane coming from landfills, or methane coming from cows, which is the predominant source of methane that we hear about in the news, right? So about 70% of methane is coming from all of these sources. And so the first question that you might ask is, how do I distinguish between these two major drivers of methane? How do I know if a molecule of methane came from a chemical source versus a biological source? And to distinguish between them, as I just mentioned, uh, we use something called isotopic signatures. And so we look specifically, we can look at deuterium and hydrogen, but a lot of geochemists and a lot of people in the petroleum and natural gas industry look at the ratio actually of C13, which is a stable isotope of carbon that's very rare, to C12, which is the dominant um, isotope of carbon. And so they look at the C13 to C12 ratio and the methane over time, and they use that as a proxy for where the methane's coming from. And the idea here is that if it's a chemical source or if it's a geological source that didn't have a biological origin, then you know, those processes essentially don't discriminate between C12 and C13. And over time, if you make methane through these sources, those ratios will, that ratio will increase. So you'll get more C13 methane in the atmosphere. But if your methane's coming from a biological source, enzymes, are very good at distinguishing between the light and the heavy isotope of carbon. And all enzymes have a preference for the light isotope. And so what that means is that if methane's coming from a biological source, your, methane, your C13 and the methane will keep going down over time, right? So using whether it's going up and down over time is a way to tell us where the methane's coming from. 
And if you look at these plots in the last 20 years, you see something really striking starting 2010, right? Starting 2010, what you see is that ratio between C13 to C12 and the methane has been going down drastically. Now there's many ways as a geochemist or as an atmospheric scientist, you can explain this phenomenon. But you know, the most likely way to explain this is that the spike in methane that we're seeing of late is coming from a biological source. So the surge that we're seeing in the last 20, 10 or 20 years is all coming from a biological source. And then let's go back and see what these biological sources of methane are. I said that it could be a wetland, it could be a landfill, and it could be a cow or other ruminants. But what exactly is it at each of these places that's the biological source? And if you look a little deeper, you see that it's a group of microorganisms. And these microorganisms are called methanogens, and as the name suggests, they're all methane producers. So the largest fraction of biological methane on our planet is being produced by one group of organisms called the methanogens. And so the idea is that if you want to curb methane emissions, it's actually not that hard because you can grow specifically after this one group of organisms. And that's kind of the big pitch, you know, in a lot of people, for a lot of people who are studying this problem, is that if you understand how these microbes work, you can essentially leverage their biology as a way to find the solution to the problem that we're facing globally, right? And so I presume there's some of you in this audience who may not have heard of methanogens before. And so what these are are just simple unicellular microbes. So this is just an EM image of these organisms. Um, they all belong to the domain archaea. So in fact, what's really interesting is that we've never ever found a methanogenic bacterium or a methanogenic eukaryote so far. This seems to be a very uniquely archaeal trait. Um, they all live in either anoxic, so environments completely depleted of oxygen, or microoxic, which means that there's a little bit of oxygen in those environments. And they can be free living, so they're all around us right now, but they're also host associated, which means that they're also inside us and actually an important part of our microbiota. So they're practically everywhere, you know, because there's lots of anoxic environments in and around us. And so what they do, as the name suggests, is that they take either CO2 or organic molecules and they convert it to methane. And now you might be wondering why they need methane, right? Like, why do these organisms make methane? And the reason they make methane is that the conservation of energy in these organisms is very tightly linked to the production of methane, which means that the ATP and the energy currency that the cells need is all coming from the production of methane. They also often get intermediates of their biomass from methane production. Now you might wonder, if we know so much about, if we, if we think that these organisms are so important, why may some of us have never heard about them or why is not that much research been done with them. And one of the main reasons for that is that they're so oxygen sensitive that it's actually very hard to grow them. And just to give you an idea of how oxygen sensitive they are, I don't want you to read this. That's not the goal of this. Uh, this is a New York Times article from 1967. Okay, this is at the NIH when Earl and Teresa Stadman were trying to go methanogens. And the only way they can get them to grow is that they vacuumed out an entire room of air, replaced all the gas in that room with nitrogen gas, and they would wear gas masks and oxygen tanks and walk into the room and work with these organisms. So we're using truly space age technology back in the 60s to even make a dent with these organisms. And since then, um, times have changed. We now know how we can get anaerobic chambers to work with them, but growing them is still pretty non-trivial uh, compared to many other microbes. Um, and then the other thing that I would say, just to end my talk, is that we've gotten to a place, thanks to a lot of environmental sequencing, where we have lots and lots of genome sequences for methanogens. Uh, we have a smaller but substantial fraction in, in culture. But I think the biggest bottleneck to understanding what these microorganisms are and to find solutions within their biology is to develop more genetic tools for them. Thank you.